Greg Nicotero and Tom Savini are in the hallway and they're like, should, should we come in? Should they come in? Yeah. Let's bring them in. Calm down, calm down. Okay, what do you want to know? Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the presence of greatness. How does it feel? Welcome, welcome to the panel. My name is Andrea Subisati. I am the executive editor of Room Morgue Magazine and co-host of the Faculty of Horror podcast. And I don't think I need to introduce these two. I'm Tom Savini. Oh. That's Greg Nicotero. Now, just to get a gauge of the room here, how many of us are fans? How many? All, right, all you guys that didn't raise your hands, you gotta go. Sorry. Well, I want to know how many of us are um, special effects, prosthetic artists, hopefuls. Oh, my. Nobody. All right. You hey, there's win. one back there. How do we feel about that, gentlemen? How many of you hate our guts? Well, here's the deal. By the end of this, you're all going to want to be prosthetic makeup artists. So, oh. so we have 45 minutes to convert you. It's going to be one of those panels. And I have a school for it. That's right. He does. Oh, that's right. We're going to talk about that for sure, but okay. I think I think one of the first things that I want to know is, I mean, young prosthetics artist, have you guys to look up to? Who did you have when you started out? Oh, are you kidding? Lon Chaney, Jack Pierce, Dan Winston, Rob Botin, Rick Baker. You know, we had a lot of people. And Greg, here's where you say Tom. This, well, of course, Tom. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I was really fortunate because I grew up in Pittsburgh and uh, and as a chance meeting met George Romero and George I was 15 and George was always the kind of person that was like oh you should just come down to the office and hang out and just you know so th that's how I ultimately met Tom when Tom was working on Creep Show I had been invited to the set to meet um, to just go see George and they had a big gymnasium uh, in Monroeville, and Tom's office was down in a little corner, and I kind of went in and introduced myself, and then found myself on weekends, because I was still in high school, going out at when they were working on Saturdays, and Tom was good enough to let me hang out in his studio, so I watched him building Fluffy, and... What, you like 16 or something? 15, uh, 16, yeah, I just, I think I just started driving. It was like oh. three weeks ago, I was not very long. <laughs> Seems, um, but seems yeah, like that, yeah, it does, doesn't it? So, you know, for me, it was, it was, you know, Tom and, and Rob Bottin and Rick Baker and, and, but you know, it, it all started with that sort of steady diet of universal monsters and Frankenstein and Creature with the Black Lagoon. And I just think that, that time between like 1977 and 1985 was probably the most fertile for makeup effects because it went from there to American World from London and The Howling and Creepshow and uh, The Thing. And it was, I'm so glad that I was able to go to the theater and see those movies. Because it was like every weekend. You know, like I remember one summer it was Road Warrior and Creepshow and Blade Runner. And it was like every weekend there was another big genre movie. Poltergeist, E.T. You know, you just, all the movies you guys love, like we went, we went to the theater to see them. And, and I'm grateful that I had that experience. But I'm also grateful that you guys are still, that you guys still, you know, embrace that kind it's of work. It's 40 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Some of you weren't even born yet. <laughs> yes. So with George Romero being kind of the connective tissue to get, uh, get you guys connected and, and to get your career going, I, Romero strikes me as a very collaborative filmmaker uh, with his talent, very respectful of his talent and what they bring to the table. And I've always wondered, like, did you guys collaborate much with George on those effects sequences? Like, oh, did he write them to the page and no, you executed them? No, 80% of Dawn of the Dead we came up with. We would just go to George and say, hey, how about if we drive a screwdriver? And, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so then we're making a retractable screwdriver and then in doing it. But George would let you uh, improvise like I just uh, gave you an example of. But even as an actor, you know, you, just, you could just improvise and he loved it. He encouraged it, actually. Mm -hmm. but that I was think, a lot of fun. But I think that Tom's style really influenced George as a filmmaker as he evolved. Mm. Because he gave Tom a lot of freedom. You know, Tom had 
had at that point really started pioneering a lot of unique makeup effects that hadn't been done before because his history was <clears throat> misdirection and you know oh you take a machete magic. and you magic you cut the yes. section out you know it was all misdirection it was all yeah. magic it was all so those tricks and when it came to day of the dead which was my first my first job with with the two of them george really um he really never dictated stuff it was like you know when we shot the whole scene in day of the dead when they're running away from roads and they're going through the the cavern they that sequence in the script was called laugh in the dark do you remember that it was called laugh in the dark and it was just come up with a bunch of shit and we just came up with a bunch of stuff and, and then, then there was a pie fight and then <laughs> and then like you know the bowl was like rolling the top of the zombie's head with the shovel yeah, that yeah, was john yeah, Bullich. Yeah, yeah. and then when we did uh, weren't when you, I, weren't you giving us votes 9.5. We were, yeah, as we were, as when I, because I was recording it, because we kept having to roll the head. We rolled that head. The head had yeah. to land a certain way because it had radio controlled eyes, and we did it like 20 times. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, there was little rocks. But it then had when, to hit a certain spot. When we did Land of the Dead, it was kind of the same way. At that point, George was just like, just bring me a bunch of cool shit. And of course, I was so excited and grateful to be the effects department head on that show that we built Cole's puppets and we did all kinds of stuff because it was like George's sort of return to form from yeah, Day of the Dead yeah. to Land of the Dead, which was, you know, 20 years. Yeah. I'd like to know if either of you have an anecdote about a bit that didn't look like it was going to work out and did in the end. Well, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but they work because you've got take two, take three. Mm -hmm. You just keep doing it until it works, you know. However... Everything I planned to do on Stephen King in Creepshow didn't work. We had a, we had a hand that grew plants. Had, we couldn't get the green lenses in his eyes because his reflexes were too tight. You know, and um, we had a tongue that grew, couldn't. And I wanted to impress this guy. It's Stephen King. Nothing we tried on him worked, no matter how many takes. So that was, that was, that was the only uh, bad experience I've had in, in doing effects. Can we go back to the hand that grew plants? The hand that grew plants, yeah. What happened? What do you mean? It, 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 they wouldn't come out. You know, it was like a cable system. Was it reverse? It would have been, yeah, yeah. Pulling them in. No, no, I think it was, it was the, the push-pull cable thing. Right. Where we could get them to come out of his fingers. Anyway, couldn't work. But oh, also he had... That grew, oh, I was thinking Jordy that... Verrill, the Jordy Verrill Jordy episode Verrill, of Creepshow. Okay, all right. I was thinking of a prosthetic that like rotted and got like, uh, I don't know, too much Oh, well, you, don't you know about the pig intestines? Okay, when when Joe Pilato is killed in, I'm, why am I always the bad guy in this story? He's he's gut boy. He's gut boy. He was in charge of the pig intestines. Okay, so we all went to Florida for two or three weeks to shoot those sequences down there. While we were gone, somebody unplugged the refrigerator, so those guts were rotting in this refrigerator in a five-gallon drum. You know, it was two o'clock in the morning. You can't go out and buy new pig intestines, you know. We could so, have, well, if we really wanted to. You had to drive like two hours, you know, and, and they wouldn't have been open. It was two in the morning. But he went to get the pig intestines, and he came back mortified. I think you put a... That was bad. A gas ma We all wore gas masks, you know. <laughs> but poor Joe, he, we couldn't protect him because you would see up his nose because he's lying there. So he had to lie there under the floor trapped for hours smelling the pig intestines. But wait, but there's a little bit more to the story. So when we first started Day of the Dead, actually I was telling Tom yesterday, it was 40 years ago this month when we started shooting Day of the Dead. So it was October 1st. And, um, and the, one of the first scenes we shot was when Miguel, where, where Sarah has the dream sequence that oh, Miguel, Miguel and his, Miguel guts, come out, and his yeah. guts come out. Yeah. So we, we went and, you know, of course, because of Tom's pedigree from Dawn of the Dead is like, you can make fake intestines, but nothing's better than the real thing. So I went to a butcher shop and bought real pig intestines and we cleaned them. So that's October. So then we put them in bleach and clean. We them. used them over and over. We again. used them October, November, December, <laughs> and then over the Christmas holidays when they turned off the power to the refrigerator. So when we came back in January from the Fort Myers shoot, we were walking to the room, and we were about a hundred yards away. And I'm like, Oh, oh shit! I the, something smells really bad. He has a much better memory. Than so I do. literally, we kept those for four months. Yeah, we could have just. Yeah. Yeah. Gone and bought it. Now they're eighty dollars of pig intestines. Yeah. So then the goal was we had to shoot. I think it was the next day. So I had to put the intestines in in the sink, 
and poured bleach on them again to clean them. And there was so much bacteria that the be bleach was like fizzing and bubbling up. And I'm just like, whoop, shit. Well, we got to clean them. But they were so rancid. Oh. But we never thought, like, I could have just been like, Tom, maybe we should just go buy new ones. But Well, we didn't know they were going to unplug the refrigerator. You know? No, but. Yeah. Ah, the good old days. My I'm going to have to look up the date of that. Of that shoot, it was. It would have been in January, so it'll be 40 years this January that I was gut boy. <laughs> My hangover can barely tolerate that story. I'm just yeah, gonna, trust just gonna me. Save that for it'll later. It'll give you an instant hangover. And I'm feeling a bit better. Um, have you ever had to say to a filmmaker, "Nope, that's impossible. I can't do that." No, the job is to create it. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Okay. We we were doing we were doing a movie called Eraser. And there's an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, and there's a scene where James Caan, where they're in this uh, animal enclosure with alligators. And Arnold shoots the glass out, and all the water floods out, and these alligators swim in. So we built self-contained hydraulic alligator puppets that could oh. swim around the tank. And then they would blow the glass, and the alligators would come out. So we shot that one day, and then the next day we had these puppets, and the alligators weighed six, seven hundred pounds each, and um, the legs had movement in them, and the heads were all hydraulic and really, really elaborate, like T Rex Jurassic Park elaborate. The director walks in, Chuck Russell, and he goes, "Okay, first shot, I want the alligator to walk from there to there," and he just turns and walks away. I'm like, "These don't—they don't walk." They're like, they weigh 800 pounds. They're on this little, a little stand. So I'm sitting there thinking, okay, what the hell? So the, the set had about that much water in it. So I said, wait a second, why don't we get one of those creeper dollies, doorway dollies that they, you use to do work underneath cars. And I said, we'll put the alligator on it. We'll puppeteer the legs and we'll just pull it with a cable really fast. So, um, <clears throat> comes up for the shot and we hide the cable under the water and the alligator's sitting on the little on the little tra uh, track and we say roll cameras and the puppeteers making the legs go and they say action and we just pulled it like eight feet and the little legs are moving and the head's moving and it looked great and half an hour earlier we had no fucking idea how to do it oh yeah <laughs> so you know the moral of that story is you never say no you you what you do is you give the filmmaker options but you'll, you'll bring a cow to the set that there was no discussion of ever making it talk. Gino tells me this story about a commercial he did with a cow hanging. And the director will say, can, uh, can you make, can it talk? You know, they want it to talk. Well, you can't be prepared for something like that. <laughs> but you would lie and say, yeah, give me a minute. And then you'd literally <laughs> cut the back of the mouth out Get your and you'd have a hand. guy inside there. Yeah, you'd yeah, figure yeah. out a way to do it. That's the fun part. You know, a lot of that fun is kind of lost now because everyone just, oh, we'll just do it in post later. Can you make a talk? Yeah, watch. And they hit three buttons in CGI and then it talks. So it's not as much fun, you know. Well, speaking of CGI, and obviously there have been tremendous advancements in technology and technique and materials that have come out since you first started. What's one thing that hasn't changed and never will about the game? Hmm. That's a good question. Well, the, ma the materials change, mm -hmm. but the science is the same. To me, they're magic tricks. My books about special makeup effects are called Grand Illusions because I think of them as grand illusions. They're, it's like he said before, you're misdirecting, you're using mechanical <coughs> devices that nobody knows about, and that's exactly what a magician does to fool you, to make you believe that what you're seeing is really happening. We're doing the same thing. Our job is to make you believe that what you're looking at is really happening and then create the pieces, you know, because it's a film and it's piece by piece, you know? Well, also, you know, if you look at the the prosthetic makeup design like if you look at penguin and you look at colin farrell's makeup it's absolutely brilliant and it's the same technique it's do the live cast they sculpt the makeup it's made out of silicone if you haven't seen it there's so many videos on youtube about them transforming colin farrell into the penguin have you seen that makeup that's wonderful freaking great that's mike marino yeah so as soon as if, if you have makeup artists telling somebody that makeup is great then that makeup is great well so, one other thing that changed is we don't cast heads anymore we'll do a scan of his head and 3d print it and there it is right there we didn't have to make him 
be covered in Elgin 8 and do an impression, it's right there. It's exactly him because of the scan. So that's, that's one thing that has changed. Well, and then now people will actually do the makeup in ZBrush and instead of printing, will print the negative mold. Oh. Well, you print the mold and then you pour the silicone in it and you open it up and the piece is done. So you don't have to physically have a sculptor anymore. Yeah, my business partner digital. has Colossum Studios. You know, he did the Bray Wyatt figure for and all the masks for WWE. But uh, I, had, I had a hand of Fluffy, my crate creature, and he scanned it, reversed it, and now I have the left hand, you know? Yeah. Would have never had that before if it wasn't for 3D printing and laser scanning, you know, anyway. So it sounds like a lot of these changes are net positive for everyone involved, right? Like, obviously, an actor would prefer not to have a mold made of their head. Sometimes. I mean, it depends. I mean, all actors are different, too. Yeah. But, you know, the, the thing about someone like Colin Farrell or, um, you know, if you look at, like, Amadeus and you look at these other makeups... The, the prosthetics makeup artist's job is really only 60% there. The actors have to bring the character to life. They have to know how to move in the makeup. They have to not be con constricted. Mm -hmm. you know? And but they also have to understand that it's a commitment. You know, It's three and a half hours in the chair. Then you got to get the set. Then you have to act in it. And then you got to get cleaned up and do it again and again and again. So you know, you have <clears> to, the <throat> actors have to bring the makeup to life otherwise. It's That's right, but you, you, know, you could have a mild-mannered accountant who sits in a chair and never emotes and is a complete introvert. Put a mask on him, pretty soon he's jumping on the table and you know, put a gorilla suit on somebody, you know, you know, they're running around like the gorilla. Yeah. So that's a great transformation that we see all the time. Well, like Eddie Murphy, Eddie Murphy was like that. Eddie Murphy was one guy, and then when you put him in the makeup, Mike Myers, we did one of the Austin Powers movies, and he's... Uh, literally, they become a different person. Yeah. They ha they have that strange self consciousness about them, but then you put the makeup on them, and they become a different person. Because they're they're free. They're yeah. they're, they're they are hidden. This is what counts. What's out yeah. here, you know. I think that's something that's so fascinating about special effects makeup and indeed about masks. And if that interests you guys, Doug Bradley has a really great book kind of all about that, the transformative nature of yeah. that. And that's, that's what you guys bring to the table. That's what uh, you're able to unleash upon the world through these actors. That's the fun. That's the yeah. fun. You keep looking at my questions. You're not allowed to look at these topics. Well, I just wondered if anybody out there had questions. <laughs> well, we're going to get to that, okay. but I'm the moderator, so I'm going to go first. Damn. Wanna... So there, and Damn. fuck you. <laughs> wow. I can talk to these guys like that. We're paisan. I don't know if you've seen our Are you surname. Of course. All right, well, that, yeah. that changes everything. <laughs> now, and he's Italian. And you're Italian. Three Italians, no waiting. <laughs> Um, I want to talk just a little bit about uh, your career trajectories in terms of you've both taken stints in the director's seat, uh, you've done other stuff, uh, Tom, you've got your books. Did your career overall feel like a natural trajectory or was there ever a time where you felt like you wanted to change gears and you steered it in a certain direction? No, it just fell on me. You know, it just happened. Everything I wanted just, you know, came into my, it just happened, you know. Um, I, I really wanted to be an actor in movies, and I thought makeup effects would be a way to get in the door, and it did, because all of a sudden I'm not doing makeup and effects anymore. I'm acting, you know? And then uh, I got a directing gig. Romero wanted me to direct Night of the Living Dead. And by the way, if you like that movie, <clears throat> next year, something very wonderful is going to happen with that movie. It's going to be re-released re -released by Sony, and uh, it's going to be completely uncensored and uncut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love they, they, that they, really I'm went, they really put a lot into it. Yeah. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and my original thought was the movie should start in black and white and then eventually become color. You know, as a homage to the original film, and then this is the new one. Well, that's exactly what's going to happen now. So I used to say the movie was only 30% of what I intended. Now it's more like 60, you know, so. And that's next year. But wait, why did I say that? What did you ask me? Career, tra <laughs> oh, career, career tra trajectory. Yeah. Okay, yes, yes. So now I'm directing, and uh, you know that's why George didn't hire me to do um, the dark half. He thought I would be off doing publicity tours, 
for the movie, which is what exactly happened, you know. So, um, and then he hired me to direct something, uh, one of the episodes of Creep Show, his Creep Show television series. So it just, you know, I never, to answer your question, I never thought, you know, things need to change. You know, things just kept building up and happening, and I just uh, expected it to sort of happen like that, you know. Yeah. Like when they say, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, what's going to happen to you when you grow up is more appropriate to me. Well, you've never grown up, so fortunately, so that'll never you don't happen. have that yeah. problem. I mean, you know, look, and the other, the other thing that's interesting is um, when, you, when you have a job that you love and, and you, every day you go. and It's, it's not a, work. It's, it's a new adventure. Yeah. And it's a new challenge. Like, it's not just you go to work and it's the same job every day. Every movie's different. Every movie has different challenges. So I, I just went with it. Like, you know, when I first started working with Tom, we did Day of the Dead. And then the next movie we did was Invasion USA. And then we went and you directed Tales from the Dark Side. You helped me on that. And then I was jumping back and forth and went to L.A., but you know, I, it was it was it was an exciting time for me because I I was kind of a nomad. Most most movie people are nomads. You don't stay in the same town very long. You don't live anywhere too long because you go where the the job takes you. Yeah. And it's very it's it, it it's very romantic. You know, I'm filming in Madrid right now with Norman Reedus and Melissa McBride. Um, so I get to live in Europe for I've lived in Europe for like a year over before a that year. was Paris. Yeah, so, you know, that's really exciting. But I would have never imagined. I just went wherever it took me. And I think with the directing for me was people were like, oh, we got this whole effects unit, and we we didn't need to get all these shots done. So for, like, on the faculty, I shot a lot of the creature stuff. And then on the mist, I shot a lot of the creature stuff. And on Land of the Dead, George was like, I need you to go shoot all the gory stuff. So even a lot of the scenes of the zombies eating, eating people, George didn't even shoot a lot of that. I shot a lot of that, which of course for me, being a huge Romero fan, I wanted George. George, you should. I want to see what you do. Yeah, but you were in fact the second unit director. I was the yeah. second unit director. So yeah. so it, it it came to I shot a short film, and uh, United Monster, I mean, which is kind of like a, a a fun little movie. I had the idea when I was waiting in line at Universal Studios. I'm like. What if like monsters were real and that that was a that was like a a talent agency that would lease the monsters to different film studios? So if you needed the creature from the Black Lagoon, they would send handlers out to set. So it's on YouTube. It's really fun. It's called United Monster Talent Agency. Yes, thank right. you. Tom. It's hilarious. Uh, so it's anyway, hilarious. so then what ended up happening was when we were getting ready to do season two of Walking Dead, Frank's like, "You're ready." Frank Darabont said, "You're ready to direct an episode," and he said. Do you want to direct a zombie heavy episode or a zombie light episode? And I'm like, that's a trick question. I know it. <laughs> um, and but then of course I said, well, I want to do a zombie light episode because I know how to shoot the zombie stuff because I did it for George and I've done it before. So I want something that's not very many zombies and it's a little more, you know, like character driven. So they gave me an episode in season two where Dale is killed. There's one zombie in the entire episode. Um, and it ended up being a big dramatic thing about they find this character, Randall, and they, it's a big tribunal where they're trying to decide if they're going to kill this guy or not, and whether they're, how they deal with their own humanity. It was the first episode of Walking Dead that I ever directed, and that was in season two. And then they're like, okay, well, you're the guy on the ground, so you're going to become the producing director. And I ended up directing 40 episodes uh, of The Walking Dead. So... Um, you know, when people say, what's your favorite one? I'm like, there's so many. They're your children. You know, yeah. Carol going to Terminus and blowing up the, the propane tank and all that stuff. You know, when they're all leaning over the trough and the guys are hitting them in baseball bats and slitting their throats. And I hated like, that. I hated that. I loved that. Uh, you know what? Uh, he told me a story about that. They, he didn't even need to put prosthetics on their necks. He put the tube on their neck to squirt the blood out. And then the visual effects team just erased the tube. Yeah. So there was no makeup to worry. But well, why did you hate it? Did it disturb you? Yeah, it was really disturbing. The way she thought of it. I win. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everybody. No, I called you. I called I you. Remember? remember? I called him and said, "Oh my God, what a, what a scene!" You know? Well, Anybody see brutal, Terrifier three? It's a brutal world. And you love it. <sighs> it's so vile. You should turn your mic off right now before you say something you don't want to say. All right, let's open it up to the audience now. Yeah, right here. I know you just 
said they're all your children, but do you have a favorite piece or a favorite monster? Well, Fluffy from Creepshow, yeah. Thought, so you mentioned it a lot. Yeah, because I had never done an animatronic creature before. I called Rob Botine. He taught me how to do it over the phone for two hours. You know, so that was great fun, yeah. I don't know. It's hard because, you know, the, the volume of stuff that, that our company has done to go back and sort of pick something. You know, I love the makeups in Sin City. I thought Mickey Rourke's makeup and Benicio Del Toro and Nick Stahl. And, like, that was really, for me, one of the, the most unique experiences because we never shot any of the actors in the same scene. You'd have Mickey Rourke on green screen sitting on a chair, and then, like, three weeks later... Jessica Alba would come in and she'd be in the opposite chair on green screen. And so the idea that Robert so faithfully um, stuck to the comic book and it was really a great, it was a really fun experience. And, you know, with Bruce Willis and, and Clive Owen, there was so many great actors in there every day, some new. And then we did part two, Lady Gaga was there and Christopher Lloyd and all these people would just show up for Well, a he day. also just restored the shark from Jaws. The one that's hanging in the Academy in the museum. museum. In LA, yeah. Well, that's not really mine. That's Steven Spielberg's. I just you I it. just fixed it. It up. was a piece of garbage <laughs> in a junkyard before you grabbed it. You know. True. So technically, I worked on Jaws, even though I was only 13 when it came out. <laughs> but my name's on the little plaque in the museum right next to the sharks. So I'm like. <laughs> and now, actually, I'm I'm producing. We're we're doing a 40th or 50th anniversary, because Jaws 50 year anniversary is next summer. So I'm producing with Laurent Bouzereau, who produces all Spielberg's documentaries. We're doing a, a 50th anniversary documentary about the making of Jaws. Anybody else? Yeah. So we met Friday morning. I talked about Maniac. Uh, so my favorite shock since the head blast. See, that movie, I was offended at that movie. <laughs> all right. I'm going to come back to that. Thank you. <laughs> No, no, no. Uh, uh, we didn't shoot his head off. Yeah. No, no, but no, for the end. Of At the, the end. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Where is that head? Yeah, we, I, we, that's a good question. Where is that head? Oh. When Joe Spinell died, yeah, he bled to death in his apartment. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he was lying with his head far away from the entrance and his feet, you know, near the door. And he had his fake head on the TV because I, I gave it to him, you know. So that when the police came in, they see this body lying there, and the head on the TV, they thought his head, he was decapitated. Yeah, but, but I gave the head to Joe Spinell. Yeah, but we did have to cast him to make it. So now the cops probably have it. I wonder what happened No, no, I, somebody, uh, Bill Lustig or one of Joe's uh, close friends took it. I remember wow. hearing that in the commentary track of Mania. Cool. Yeah, anybody? Uh, uh, right there, yeah. No, I think Greg said it. Uh, uh, it. It eventually became in my contract that I would direct the scene that my effects were in because they're magic tricks. It has to be a certain angle. This has to happen first. Establish the weapon as being real before you bring in the fake weapon. You know, it's a science to get that stuff going. So it, it wasn't a big, and you know, it wasn't a big transition. Me personally, I had directed three episodes of Tales from the Dark Side before Night of the Living Dead. And plays, I was directing plays left and right. So it wasn't a big transition. Yeah. Well, you know, the, probably the biggest challenge is working with actors. Um, because, you know, when you come to set, especially in television, television's different because television's a producer's medium. The directors show up, they shoot, and then they leave. And then the producers finish you know, the editorial and the visual effects. And because I'm a producer on The Walking Dead shows as well, I was able to see it all the way through. But, you know, the one thing that, that is critical is the actors have to trust the director. They have to. And a lot of movies that, that fail is because either the director can't communicate his vision to the actors or the actors disagree with the direction. That, and it happens a lot. It's a lot of movies that don't work because the directors had one vision and the actor had another vision. So on Walking Dead, I, because I had 
provided the zombie effects for season one, and the actors knew me as one of the big driving forces behind the creative, we developed a rapport of trust. And they trusted you. And they trusted me. So when it came time for me to step into the director's chair, they're like, oh, well, this Greg knows the show because his DNA is all over it. <laughs> so it made complete sense. That's a good way to say um, it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's... Uh, <laughs> So it really, uh, so it really is critical that when you're with actors, and I'll tell you a really funny story. There was one day we were I was shooting a scene with Stephen Yun and Lauren Cohan, and Lauren was late to set, and we had the cameras set up and we had everything rehearsed because we couldn't wait because TV you got like thirty seconds. So she comes in, and I'm like, okay, so. We've already rehearsed it. Steven's going to be here. You're going to be here. You're going to come out the door, blah, 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 blah. And she said, well, let me do it once just to see where my character would go. And, I, and that was a really interesting lesson for me because actors don't want you to say, walk in here, stand here, say your line that way. Anybody can do that. You know, when an actor gets to the set, sometimes they look around and they're like, which door? Would I come in that door or that door? You know, it, it, the character... The actors are motivated by what their characters would do. Norman always is, says to me, Daryl will never say this. Like, he'll get the script, all this dialogue. He's like, Daryl Darryl will grunt, and that would be it. <laughs> so Norman would go through and cut all his dialogue. I'm like, dude, I don't give a shit. Cut it all out. I don't yeah, care. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, the actors have, they, they have their process. And I always looked at that, that day with Lauren, and I remember thinking, okay, so I've learned something here is that sometimes when you're blocking a scene – let the actors sort of feel the space before you tell them. I, she still ended up going exactly where I wanted her to go, but I just gave her that moment to figure it out. Like, oh, yeah, well, I would come over here, and then maybe I'd come up these steps. And blah, blah, well, that's blah. what dictates where the camera goes, too. Yes. And in TV, you have multiple cameras, and you got to shoot at the same time, and you can't cross the line because of, you know, the, the rules of filmmaking. Um, and when you have, you know, when you have to shoot as, as fast. I mean, we shot, we would shoot... An hour episode in eight days. So when everyone's like, oh, yeah, well, you got to shoot a movie. I'm like, well, fuck, I shoot a movie. I shoot a movie in eight days. I could shoot a movie and I could shoot an entire movie in 16 days. Because that now if I, I'm going to be directing a movie next summer. If I had like two months, I'd be like, what the fuck am I going to do with myself all day? <laughs> like we come in at 8 a.m. by 10. I'm like, all right, I got everything I need. That's what Clint Eastwood does and those guys. Yeah, they yeah. come in and they shoot till like, Rob, Rob Reiner, they just did Spinal Tap, and they're like, yeah, Rob only shoots like six hours a day. Comes in, get all their shit done, six hours, ugh, I'm Rob Reiner, fuck you, I'm going home. <laughs> Somebody over there have a question? Yeah, go ahead, way in the back. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, what did the uh, students or peers, have they ever, have you ever seen an effect that someone's made that completely stumped you to the point where you could scratch your head and you're like, what did you do? No, because I'll call them and ask them how they did it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm always talking to Rick Baker. How the hell did you do that? You know? Yeah, no, it's like a brotherhood. You know, we, yeah, we're pals. We communicate, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's funny, like he said, because we're all friends. So even if, I, I don't think I've ever been stumped. I think the only time that I could really honestly say that I, I was like mesmerized in the theater was when I saw A Little Shop of Horror. And that plant starts talking and singing. And I'm like, motherfucker, that's great. <laughs> like, I, 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 I knew, you know, I was like, did they find a singing plant somewhere? And then they just, here, here's 50 bucks. We're going to put you in this movie. <laughs> so, I, oh, sorry. No, no, no. So I thought that was it, was, it was a brilliantly executed effect. And, you know, real quick, about a year ago, I was watching uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And Chris Wallace who d did the fly and gremlins and all that stuff, he made the melting heads. Um, unfortunately, Chris, is, his, he's lost his hearing, so he, he's deaf now, but we text all the time. So I start texting him and I'm like, dude, I'm watching Raiders of the Lost Ark and I just watched the melting head and it's the coolest fucking effect in the world and it was your thing. And so I get this big long thing back from him. He said, Steven Spielberg literally said it's his favorite shot in the whole movie. And 
Yeah, it's so great. Anyway, but then he, sorry, no, no, you can talk in a second. No, no, because he, he said something. He said candles. They okay. made candles. But, you know, then every movie had a melting head in it from, like, from that point onward. So there are a lot of, a lot of elements when you see it that you're just enamored. Well, one of my greatest days was Dick Smith wrote the introduction to my book, my last book. And in it, he was talking about the, the guy lying on the slab in Day of the Dead that was just a brain. But it's a real guy. I mean, he was moving his real arms. The actor, his head was bent way back for hours, okay? And Dick, I fooled Dick Smith. He couldn't figure out where the head was, you know. But, it, you know, it's just a magic trick. Yeah, go ahead. With George, oh, there's, there's so many memories with George Romero. He was just a big kid that happened to be a genius, you know, so. No, we uh, just, I, I, we, I adore him, yeah. There's, yeah, there, every day was a fond memory with George Romero. Yeah. Do you have one? I have a funny one because I, when we, when we started Day of the Dead, the, the, the script was much bigger and the budget was like $7 million. Um, and then they were like, well, if it's $7 million, the movie has to be rated R because we can't make our money back. And George, being the rebel, rebel that he was, was like, nobody tells me what to do. I'm going to make it unrated. So they go, like, great. And they cut the budget to $3 million. So in the original movie, I had a cameo. I was just going to be like a severed head because it was a scene where they're feeding um, meat to zombies to teach them to be soldiers. But then when the movie got pared down, George was like, oh, well, you, we're going to make your – you're going to be a character in the movie now. And I'm not an actor. He's an actor. I'm not an actor. But they put me in the movie. So there's a couple But scenes. your head is in the movie. My head's in the movie, but I had to be in the movie, too. It wasn't just... It would have right. been better if it was just my head, but I had to be in it, too. So there's a scene where we're all sitting around, and the camera starts, and I'm sitting with Tasso, and we're supposed to be smoking weed. So they rolled cigarettes with tobacco with no filter. And I was smoking filterless tobacco cigarettes for about three hours. And I don't smoke. So they break for lunch, and the whole room's spinning, and I'm green. And George comes over and starts laughing. <laughs> and he's like, are you OK? I'm like, I don't think I can get up. I said, I'm like stoned from the tobacco. And he put his hand underneath my armpit, and he sort of lifted me up. And he walked me to the cafeteria, and he was like, it was the cutest, sweetest thing. And I always loved that because George was just, he was just, he thought it was so cute that I like, and of course I could have just been like pretending, but I, you know, I didn't know. I'm like, oh, I guess I'm supposed to smoke these cigarettes. Yeah, so. way back there. Yeah, uh, I was just wondering, given your extensive careers and... Um, We've been around a long time. <laughs> Yeah, there is. There is, as a matter of fact, but I can't, I can't tell you what it is because you'll steal it. <laughs> you know, I actually typed it up, two pages with illustrations. I just gave it to Damien Leone to see if he, if, if he wants to use it, you know, but uh, no, I don't, uh, I'm not going to tell you. Yeah. But, it, but yes, it does exist. Yeah. Well, it's always, it's always fun because you're looking for um, ways to do things that haven't been done. You know, Joe Dante, um, I was meeting with Joe earlier in the year because he was trying to get a remake of Little Shop of Horrors going. It was right before Roger Corman passed away. So we did all these designs and Joe came up to the shop and I restored the howling, the werewolf from the howling, the full size rod puppet is in my office. Um, and, uh, and he told me, oh yeah, my original idea for the transformation was I wanted it to be done in one shot. And Rob Bottin told me the same thing. Rob Bottin said that they built a mechanical lamp that you could puppeteer so that the lamp would be on and you could swing the lamp away by puppeteering it back and forth. And then every time the lamp would swing away, they would cut and replace the werewolf puppet with another puppet, start rolling That's again, and clever, swing yeah. the light back in. So when you watch that shot all cut together, it looks like the, every time the lamp swings away and swings back, there's another version of the wolf, and it, and it looks like it was done in one shot. 
And that's what they originally were going to do. And Rob said, I still have the fucking lamp in my garage. So I'm like, I believe you. It didn't happen? No, they never did it. Oh, shit. Because I think then they, they talked about it and originally was like, yeah, we should do it all as one shot. No one's ever done it before, blah, blah, blah. And I think Joe decided later that from a dramatic standpoint, you needed to cut to D. Wallace and you needed to cut. And so he changed his mind and just said, no, I don't think a, a werewolf transformation in one shot would be as effective because the camera would be locked and you wouldn't be able to cut to the person. Ugh. Well, the werewolf transformation in Werewolf of London, 19, what, 35, 33, something like that, he walked behind pillars. Every time he walked behind a pillar, they would stop the camera, do some makeup, and he would come forward, and he looked different every time he passed a pillar. I did the same thing in the Tales from the Dark Side episode, where a little boy turns into a werewolf, but had a window uh, with shafts of light, and there were, there were sections of darkness. So he would walk into a shaft of light as himself, then we stopped the camera, did makeup. So when he came out of the shadows, every time he came out of the shadows, he was more of the werewolf until the final one, you know, which was, so it seems like one shot, you know, but it's an old, old, old technique. But I love that idea yeah. of the swinging lamp. That's the same thing as going through the mm -hmm. shafts of light. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, you brought up Damien in the audience. Yeah. You met him on Terrifier 3. Uh, was he the, like, freaking out? No, I met him way before Terrifier 3. We would do conventions together. And, uh, you know, I didn't know who this guy was or what Terrifier was, but he had his display there, you know? He comes over and grabs me, whispers in my ear, you see all this? It's because of you. <laughs> and he says that every time we do a convention or a get together. He, all, he, he sent me a text from uh, Spain. He said, people are passing out on Terrifier 3. They're throwing up. Technically, it's all your fault. Okay? <laughs> I love that. That was, you know, that was another honor. Yeah, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, for all one, you, have you ever done uh, a gag where you weren't sure whether or not this is something that should go to production? It looked a little bit much? Every one of them, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're killing people left and right. Obviously, Damon Leone does not suffer from that no. malady. There's no filter. <sighs> um, we, we did a movie called Dr. Giggles, that um, is a strange, has a huge following, which I, I only think, but there was a scene where um, it's a flashback and there's a little kid who's hidden inside his mom's body and the police come and you see the body and then the scalpel pops through the stomach and this little kid comes out of the stomach. And uh, This is a comedy, right? <laughs> well, it's a dark, yeah, yeah. maybe. Anyway, um, we shot that uh, years and years ago, and we made this body, and we bolted the body to this tabletop, and there was a little chamber, and we had a little kid, and we smeared blood all over the little kid and KY to make him all slippery. And then he had to crawl out, and we're watching it, and this poor little kid's like shivering because he's just, I, I'm like, what are we doing? Like, this is, this poor little kid, and it's, oh, and, and, and it was really, it, probably one of the few times that I was on set and went, huh, yeah, I don't know about this one. But then, then you go to the theater and you're not, we're not watching the movie. We pick out somebody in the audience and watch the evolution of their heart attack because we, we know what's coming, you know? Yeah. And you know that if you're there looking at it and it's disturbing, that it's going yeah. to translate through. I think we have one more, time for one more. Who's the last one? Last but not, who's Freddie had, Hat back there? Indiana, you're in the wrong fucking convention now. It's all right. I like that movie, too. So um, how does it feel now? Uh, um, uh, how does it feel throughout your extensive work through television, through film, through even uh, makeup schools? Um, how does it feel to be now an inspiration and source for a growing number of makeup artists? Well, I hear it all the time. They come up to my table and you inspired me when you did blah, 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 blah. One kid came up to my table, very introverted kind of guy, and he said he was going to do away with himself. He was going to kill himself. But he read something that I said or, or, or saw something in, a, in an interview or something that made him change his mind. You know, I got up, I hugged him, I gave him some free stuff. He's one of my best friends today, Will Wheaton, uh, Will Wilfrey. 
Oh. You know Will, Will Wheaton. Wheaton. Not Will Wheaton. Not no, Will Wheaton. it was not Will Wheaton. <laughs> it was not Will Wheaton. That will. All right. Press. That, let's see how long it takes for that to become a headline. <laughs> Um, no, so, but, yeah, so, um, it's, well, I'm happy to uh, inspire people, you know. Uh, you know, Damien Leone is a big example of that, although he went too far. <laughs> well, look, I mean. You like that, right? With, okay. with Walking Dead, I, I feel like one of the things that I've been able to pay it forward is it really sort of brought practical prosthetic makeups to a new generation of people because the people that watch Walking Dead now and a lot of young girls, a lot of girls that were, you know, because before it was predominantly men that did prosthetic makeup stuff. But, you know, Walking Dead, I've had a lot of young girls show me their portfolio and they're really interested in it. So for me, I feel like the Walking Dead single-handedly reintroduced prosthetic makeups after so many years of CGI and stuff because it was in your living room every Sunday night and you could watch it and you liked the characters and all of a sudden people were like, wait, that, what, is, what is this? And, it, you know, zombie movies too. You know, before then, we, people in this room were the only ones that really watched zombie movies. And now everybody watches zombie well, stuff. Well, 48 new students just came into my school in October. Three guys, all women. Yeah. Yeah. There's only three guys here. By the way, the school is 16 months. It's a degree program. And you make monsters all day, okay? So. <laughs> that's, your, that's your pitch. Yeah. That's, that's a good pitch. pitch. Yeah. And on uh, that note, guys, we... Wait, no, no, no. Uh, uh, ter- we saw, talked about Terrifier 3. Uh-huh. Uh, I am starring with Elvira in the Killer Clowns from Outer Space video game, okay? Yeah. And I told you about Night of the Living Dead. You said you have something coming up. I do? I have up. everything coming. I'm never. I never stop working. So That's if true. That's you true. probably will, you he's know, fall hardest, out. He's the hardest working guy I know. Walking Dead, yeah. Fallout, yeah. Interview the Vampire. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm like literally want to just go to sleep. <laughs> um, I can't talk about it yet because we're still finalizing everything, but. Uh, it's, Sometimes uh, you have to sign a non-disclosure. It's real. You really it's, can't uh, talk about it's it. It's super wild. Yeah. And it's really... Well, we got to get Greg back to his booth. We got to get Tom to bed. <laughs> it's no, late. no, no. I'll go to bed and he can go to the I'll booth. Are you guys at your booths for the rest of today? Uh, I am. I leave, in an, I leave in an hour because I have to go work. So okay. um, if you guys want stuff signed, come now. Come to mm-hmm. me and then go to Tom. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Let's get out of here.